sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to my part of this afternoon safari, or the sunset safari here on Juma. I'm Stefan Winterboer, and on camera today is Gert. Now, the run that we did this afternoon, and yes, we came and ran in the bush. It is possible to run here in the bush and not get eaten. It's not advisable to run away from dangerous stuff, though. <laughs> but we did go on a bit of an exercise run today, just to keep all the lovely food that Tandakila and Amanda prepare for us at bay. And while we were running, we passed a herd of elephant, and that's that herd of elephant that I would like to show you. There were some babies in that herd today, and I quite like babies in the afternoon, you know. Getting some boisterous play going. Not only that, but I was on the telephone today between game drives. I like to walk onto quarantine and make phone calls. The signal's a bit better there and I can amble without having to worry my staff or anything like that. And um, I happened to hear monkeys alarm calling around Voya Telepan and that was at about 11.30, 12 o'clock. So I have a feeling that there's a leopard or something hanging around this area. I don't not quite know what it is. We do know that there's a lot of lion on Buffalo's Hook on a kill. We know that there are some lions in Chitwa Chitwa. The two Birmingham boys are there and we know there's a male and female that crossed into Torchwood from Juma this morning as well. So that's pretty much most of the lions accounted for, barring obviously in other areas. Most of the lions in this area, I should say, they're highly territorial. Um, and so it probably is a leopard. However, the monkey's call that they were giving wasn't that frantic alarm call that they give for leopard. They were giving pretty much an alarm call like they had seen a lion. Now, when monkeys see a lion, they give their normal chittering alarm call, but it's sort of a half-hearted call. It's almost like a, um, I can see you, I know you're there, but I don't really care because you're a lion and you can't, catch, you, you can't climb a tree and catch me. Unlike of course, when there's a leopard around. Now, leopard are well known for catching vivid monkeys. Here we have a small bachelor herd of young bull Nyala. I think, let's see if we can show you them. We very infrequently see this particular age Nyala at Juma, and I'm not too sure why. We see huge males, and we see immature rams, or bulls at least anyway, and we see lots and lots of females, but they tend, they tend to, I don't know, go somewhere or hide out very good when they're around about this age. He is about three years old and he needs another four to five years or so to be in his prime and big, big enough to at least compete effectively for females or for mating rights but you can see that beautiful fur coat that he has easily one of the most striking antelope that we have out here now you know when i first started guiding in 1998 i only saw one nyala in the next five years one nyala so one nyala, two nyala in actual fact excuse me i saw two nyala in my first year of guiding, I saw them very close to the Sabi River, and then for the next five years, I never saw another Nyala. And here, pretty much, Nyala are popping out of the woodwork, left, right, and center. And you know, I haven't read a single piece of literature on why there's been such a build-up of Nyala numbers over the last 20 years or so in the Sabi Sands. I'm not too sure why. Contrary to how I believe things are supposed to go, which is um, exactly why they happen that way, um, instead of decreasing, we're finding that general game numbers in the Sabi Sands are increasing. Not exactly the same as was historically found in the Sabi Sands. There weren't as many Impala in the Sabi Sands. In the Kruger National Park in general, there weren't as many Impala. And nowadays, there's lots of Impala, not so many Sable, not so many Roan Antelope, but definitely lots and lots of general game. Who knows? Lots of good grass here, lots of water. Right, 
Now, while we carry on down this road, having a look for these elephants, we're going to send you over to Jamie. You'd like to say hello, I think, again. <laughs> Good afternoon, and once again, it is absolutely wonderful to have you on the back of the vehicle with us. Let's try this again, shall we? My name is Jamie, and this afternoon I have Jandre on camera with me. And together, along with Stefan Gert, we will be looking to bring you a wonderful live safari experience to fill the next 2 hours and 45 minutes of your time. Now, we are here on Arethusa at the moment to follow up on a report that Shadow was here with a kill that she then lost to the hyenas and then dashed off somewhere else. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to figure out where that somewhere else is. Shadow, for new viewers, is a an older female leopard. She is the daughter of the so-called Queen of Juma, the leopard known as Karula, who spends most of her time around the Juma area. Whereas her daughter Shadow is around Arethusa, so just to the west of where Steph is right now. We're going to be scouring the area, and as I said, it is a live safari, so what we say is the plan is usually not how things actually pan out, and usually have things going in a completely different direction. But you never know what wonderful things you might find. For example, when I first did my introduction this afternoon, I speculated as to whether or not it would be the first and only time I did the introduction. It wasn't. So, you know, things never quite go as expected. Let us go and check out the only patch of water in this area, which is Red Dam, and see whether or not Shadow, perhaps distressed by the loss of her kill to the hyenas, didn't decide to come and console herself with a drink at the water's edge. Now I say it is one of the only water points. It is also in this particular area. We're in our dry season, so we're not really meant to have much water around anyway, but we are definitely meant to have more water than we do now. Oh, there's a log in the middle of the road. Now there's half a log in the middle of the road. Um, it is unbelievably dry. We've had hardly any rain during our wet season last year and the beginning of this year. At the moment, the animals are starting to struggle for water availability, which for things like elephants and buffalo and zebra makes life very difficult. For our predator species, on the other hand, this is a time of plenty for all of them. And our lions were incredibly successful this morning. They roared and roared throughout Juma and built up our hopes that we would be treated to a lion sighting this morning, only to have our hopes dashed when they killed a buffalo just to the east of where we could go and see them. And yours has been very kindly, and yours and many others, very kindly putting up some lovely photographs of what we missed out on this morning. And I shed a few tears and then comforted myself with the knowledge that they will at some point be back towards Juma. I think both Steph and myself have decided that for now lion tracking is just not going to happen. I'm going to focus instead on finding us a leopard for the afternoon. So far off to a sterling start. We have one hippopotamus. One hippopotamus and his passenger. A terrapin hitching a ride on the sunny back of a hippo in Red Dam. And he's found his usual patch in the corner. That seems to be where he likes to go. And on this unusually hot day in the middle of winter, a 24 degree day, so 75 degrees Fahrenheit, not quite so hot as it was yesterday afternoon. Our terrapin has decided to spend some time sheltering from the cold of the water, sitting on the back of the hippopotamus. It's a wonder their, their necks don't get sore. <laughs> it's obviously their natural position, but it looks so uncomfortable. Now, from one thick-skinned animal to another, and I'm referring to the animal that Steph has found, of course, not Steph himself, let us go from the hippopotamus to the animal that Steph said he really wanted to find you. I'm, I'm definitely more thick-headed than I am thick-skinned, and we managed to find these elephant. 
Have a look at this guy on our right hand side. He's swallowing an entire tree. Excuse me for whispering like this, but we're right in the middle of this herd of elephant and in a very thick bush. Limits our movement. Just have a look at that elephant. <laughs> Uh, it is actually pretty awesome. For any of you with lingering doubts about whether or not elephants enjoy trees, and just eating the bark as you can see, not the wood itself, and that's because the wood has very little nutritional value. The majority of the nutrition in this type of vegetation lies in the bark itself. <clears throat> Excuse us, there's an airplane flying over overhead. Well, I mean, if they're not fussed about an airplane flying over the head, I think I can increase the volume of my voice a little bit. <laughs> uh, Alright, so we're in this it's basically, we call it a breeding herd of elephant. And it's when, a breeding herd is a, is a herd of elephant that has youngsters with them. This herd of elephant has youngsters with it. I'm trying to see an elephant that I can show you. This one is a youngster. Not quite what we'd call newborn, but definitely between five and ten years old. And it would be made up of mostly females with their babies, adult females with their babies. A bunch of adolescent males perhaps and number anywhere usually from about six to about 12 individuals I don't quite know how many elephants are here earlier I did manage to see probably around about 15 or so elephant together that was what I bumped into while I was busy with my phone call but they may have split they may have just come together at the same time to go down to the water to drink and have now gone on their separate ways again. But I must be honest, wherever I'm looking, there are elephant. James in spring South Africa hello James you've just asked me or remarked on a comment I think Jamie made about there being plants here that animals can't well animals eat but we can't because they're poisonous and you wanted to know are there any plants here that uh, that that animals don't eat at all James yes there actually are most of the euphorbia plants here it looks like a cactus the animals don't eat at all and to be honest there's only a few animals that can eat things like tambuti trees and that sort of thing and uh, very few animals literally nyala kudu and black rhino are really the only animals that can browse a tambuti tree in the summer in the winter you do find tambutis being browsed by elephant that's because most of the bad compounds are um, are sucked into their roots we've got an elephant sneaking up behind us i don't quite know no he's not he's decided against it We've got a youngster, I think, that's wanting to play a game with the car. But he seems to be okay. Let's go forward a little bit. Let's see if we can sneak up to this female who's pushing her baby through the bushes here. And we can see if we can show the little one to you. They're awfully cute when they're this age. We get ourselves into a position that will allow us to see a little bit down the road. He has this youngster here. Have a look at that. Hello, boy. <laughs> Head up. It was because he was in front of his mom, not behind his mom. Young bull. And this is an old female. You can just see by her hide, her skin, that she's old. She just looks weather beaten. She's not as old as you get, elephant. Old elephant are very similar to humans in the fact that their bodies start to lose a little bit of condition. And skin starts to hang a little bit and, you know, they're just looking a little bit older, I suppose, without being an insult. She's probably in her 40s or 50s. And on average, she probably would have had a calf every two to five years since she was 
about 15 to 18 years old. Isn't that amazing? Elephant numbers in the park over the last hundred and sort of 20 years or so have increased dramatically. They went from three elephant in 1903 to roughly just below 20,000 elephant in 2016. So they do incredibly well. These have come together to share some or other tree here. See this one on this side, he's having a bit of a difficult time breaking the stick. So now what he's decided to do is just stuff it into his mouth and bite it off rather than try and break it. Oh. <laughs> Guy's using his tip of his trunk to stuff it into his mouth. Wherever I'm looking, there's just elephant. We're literally surrounded by them. Now, as you can see, they're showing no real. They're, they're showing no real, or we having no real effect on them. Right, now I've just heard a bush buck give a big alarm call in front of us and I think I'm actually going to go and follow up on that bush buck giving an alarm call. I don't quite know what to do. We, I know this area very well in front of us and That's a nice update for all you out there. Brent is currently live on Facebook out of Kigali in Rwanda. Please go and have a look if you're interested in Brent's story. He has got an update for you on what they did yesterday. For those of you who are just hearing this for the first time, we went as Safari Live to go and look at gorillas. We tried to bring you a show all the way from the gorillas yesterday, but we couldn't get an internet connection going from the side of the mountain all the way from Rwanda, but Brent is currently in Kigali, one of the major cities in, in Rwanda, on Facebook. Go and have a look there. Go and listen to what he has to say. Maybe you can ask him a question and interact a little bit while we sit here with these elephant. Quite a small cow. There's a big cow. She's enormous. Now, what I just said is that a bushbuck has just given a very big alarm call in front of us here. But I know this area in front of us, and it's quite a distance between here and the next road and that alarm call was done in this thicket there's just no way that we'd be able to drive inside here you can see what the bush looks like in front of us um, so what I'm going to do is actually give that leopard I think it's a leopard a leopard will only it's only a leopard that will elicit a bark like that from a nyala give him about five minutes to get out of this thick area and then I think what we're going to do is move through this area and see if we can pick something up for you. It's amazing. You switch your car off and all of a sudden you start hearing all the bush news that comes through. We're going to stay just here. I know Jamie wants to give you a quick update on what she's up to. We'll be right here or probably looking for that leopard when you return. See you just now. I am so excited to give you an update. The update is that it doesn't appear that Shadow has gone too far away from where that kill was. And the reason I say that is I have not picked up one track moving out of the area. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm checking the, the last road that essentially what we do when there's a, there's a sighting in a block, so in between several roads, is you do a, a circle of that area and you look for anywhere that the animal's tracks might have come out and give you a direction as to where they're going. Her tracks haven't come out of three out of the four roads and we're on the fourth now. Just double checking really carefully that she's not just lying up in the shade. Because what we've learned a lot about with leopard behavior is a lot of the time when they get chased away they actually don't go too far. They often just hang around to see what's going to happen next to see if they've still got an opportunity to perhaps grab a little bit of the scrap because leopards are most definitely not above scavenging the leftovers so she might have decided to wait around 
for the hyenas to finish off with whatever they might grab and to see whether or not she might be able to collect any scraps or she actually might have been so exhausted from the kill itself that she might have decided to just go and find a spot to lie down in the shade. Now Shadow's got a four month old cub with her. It wouldn't have been with her when she made this kill, or perhaps it would have, but I, that would also make tracking her easier because then you've got a better chance of, you know, tracking two animals as opposed to one. There's a chance that she might have left more tracks. Now we're checking very carefully around here. This is a main road, so it is tricky to spot footprints on and a lot of there's a lot of vehicles driving up and down during the middle of the day but if you check the boundaries of the road the sort of soft patches of sand where people tend not to drive you've got a better chance of picking up a footprint crossing over now it looks as though look we can't we can't make any guarantees or promises but Steph picked up on male leopard tracks on Gowrie Main this morning that he said looked small now Sindile's tracks look small, we don't know where he went from where we last had him around Gauri Cutline, sharing that Impala kill with Mvula, but we suspect that he is still hanging around the area. I'm going to pop my nose into where the kill was last and while I do that, let's head back to Steph who has still got some Ellie's for you. Absolutely still have some Ellie's. We're following them through this thick bush and I must be honest, I, f I almost feel like we're part of the herd. They're giving us so little attention. It's just, it's bizarre. It's like we almost don't even exist to them. And it's allowing us such an intimate experience with these elephant. The matriarch, she came out of the, of the bush just as you left us. And enormous cow. We've got an elephant coming up behind us. Let's just see what he does. No? You know with Ellie's you've got to keep your eyes open. 360. You get these youngsters that are a bit boisterous and a bit, say they, they're mischievous is probably the word I'm looking for. Every now and again they sneak up behind you and give this almighty trumpet that makes your heart jump out of your skin. My, deaf, my ego won't suffer me getting a fright and squealing here. That's the Ellie that tried to sneak up on us. Amazing how effortlessly they actually walk through the bush. Almost seem to glide through. Mary, you've asked a very interesting question. Um, I suppose it comes down to the area that, no, it isn't actually, I'm, I'm wrong in that one. You've asked me at what age are elephant mature. Elephants follow very closely the, a similar sort of ad, development stages to humans. So at about 21 years of age, an elephant is considered to be full grown. An elephant bull will go into must any time between 15 and 31 in an area where there are no older bulls. Usually when there are older bulls, he'll only go into must for the first time after he's 31 years old. Around about 35, he starts to go into must for the first time. Elephant females are mature, sexually mature, anywhere from about 13 years old to about 16 years old. 12 to about 16 years old. It's different for different elephants, similar to how it's different for different people. Um, and they're considered adolescent until they reach about 20, 21 years old. So nice question there, Mary, actually. The trick is, of course, trying to judge how old an elephant is. It's actually very, very difficult to judge how old an elephant in, is. The only real way to do it is to decide at what set of molars they're on. Elephant gets six sets of molars that come in at different stages of their life, with the last set of molars coming in at around about 45 years of age. It's diet depending. But at 45, they've got their last set of teeth, and then the vegetation that they eat dictates how old they will get. Elephant living in areas where they eat a lot of coarse, hard, woody material, they don't live for much past 50. 
In this area where they mix up half the year with grass and half the year with woody species of plants, they live to about 50 to 60 years old. But it's not uncommon for elephants to live in swampy areas to go between 60 and 75 years old. That's an enormous age for an animal that basically lives outside like these animals do, has no doctors, has no advanced medical care whatsoever. I mean, you put human development back into that and you look at the average life expectancy of someone back in the day where there was no advanced medical care whatsoever and you lived major, or for the majority of your life outside living a very hard life and you'll see that the life expectancy wasn't much past 20 and yet these animals without any support can live into their 70s, 75 years old I'll switch my car off so that we can I can sneak basically. I don't know how I'm going to sneak in a 2,000 kilogram Land Rover, but we're going to try and sneak <laughs> into this area. We got the matriarch, I think, on our right hand side. Let's see if I can show her to you. She's got this most enormous pair of tusks for a female elephant. Now, what we don't want is to have a reaction on these elephants, we don't want them to panic. Here's what I think is the matriarch. She's the largest elephant here. And by matriarch, I mean an elephant herd is led by the oldest, or let me, not the oldest, by the fittest, most experienced elephant cow, which is not necessarily the oldest. A matriarch can pass on her title to a daughter once she passes a certain age. But generally it's the oldest cow or the biggest cow in the group. A patriarchal society is a group of animals that is completely led by a male. There are very, very few patriarchal societies in the bush out here. Lions are matriarchal, believe it or not, even though we think the male lion is the king of the beast. Hyenas are matriarchal, elephants are matriarchal, buffalo herds are matriarchal. Obviously those are animals that are living in herds and in groups with one another. These two youngsters look like they're going to have a bit of a tussle for a morsel. You can see this elephant's ears folded over at the top. Elephants' ears make up about 20% of the covering, the skin covering of an elephant's body. Those ears are just jam-packed with blood vessels, and the elephant pumps all of his blood through his ears, thereby cooling it down and keeping their core body temperature low. They're warm-blooded, so they have to have a constant body temperature. If they get too hot, they can actually die from heat exhaustion. But those ears are perfectly suited to keeping their temperatures down. They flap the ears and the draft cools it down. They can also wet their ears. Have a look at these two having a wrestle. <laughs> Alice, you've asked all the way from Ohio, good day to you. You've asked, is there purpose um, to an elephant being so wrinkled? Um, Alice, generally in nature, when an animal is wrinkled or has a dewlap, it's to allow for expansion. It's to allow an animal to get full or to get empty. However, I mean, in an elephant's case, is that the case? I don't know. I don't know what I want to say to you here. Suffice it to say that they're just wrinkly animals, I think. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how to answer that question. They don't swell and contract um, as they are full or have have a lot of water or anything like that and they definitely don't grow into their skin because even old elephants are wrinkly so no I think it's just because that's what they are wrinkly beings So peaceful spending time with these Ellies, I must be honest with you.
See if we can go into this drainage line in front of us and get elephant crossing across the sand. We've got a narrow window here of elephant that might come into the sand and give us an opportunity to view them. There we go. Let's see these guys here. They, lit elephant can literally go anywhere. I've seen elephants on top of rocks. I even have a photograph of some elephant dung at a viewpoint on top of a mountain, on top of a cliff 600 meters high. On top of this rock, I sat next to the rock, next to this piece of elephant dung, testimony to an elephant that had been there and enjoyed the view before me. See these Ellie's having a tussle. The one doesn't quite want to walk down. He thinks his friend's going to push him from behind. He's bracing himself. <laughs> They're quite playful, these young Ellie's, I must be honest. That female in the back there, she's just warily just stuffing food into her mouth. Shame. They're eating anywhere between 20 and 24 hours a day at the moment. That's so that they can get enough vegetation into their bellies that carries enough nutrients to keep them going for the next day. This female is just coming to discipline her baby a little bit. Doesn't like her playing with the naughty one. <laughs> I'm going to come behind our vehicle now, leaving this youngster. Our oh, beard, you've just asked me if we have any sort of conifer pine-like trees here. Not where we are, there's only one um, endemic conifer and it's a type of cypress that occurs only in the Waterberg region on the inland plateau. So South Africa just has one cypress which is a type like a conifer, not, not, not is a conifer, like a type of conifer. Um, and I haven't seen elephant eat it. There are elephants that occur in those mountains and I've, I haven't seen it. Here, not really. We have a few evergreen trees. Some elephants enjoy them. Some of the trees. Others, generally, if a tree is evergreen, it's not really touched. It's, I'm going to keep quiet now because I want to see what this elephant does. So I'm going to drop my voice down to a whisper. I want to see what he does. He hasn't got the luxury of his mother close by. And I think this young bull is going to try and squeeze past us here. The rest of the herd is behind him and behind us. Let's see what he decides. Let's see if we can read his mind. Obviously, the closer he gets to us, the more nervous he's going to become or the more uncertain of himself he's going to become. He's probably in around about, I would say he's probably around about five to eight years old. And he's a young bull, which makes them quite boisterous. At this age, he knows that he's bigger than most things around here. He's much bigger, or not much bigger, but he's bigger than a full-grown adult buffalo. The only thing that would be bigger than him out here is a white rhinoceros and other elephant, which gives these youngsters quite an attitude when they are when they have a bit of distance from the vehicles as soon as they get close to the cars you can see their confidence start to wane that trunk just seeking out every last morsel Let's see what he does you can see his feet are almost too big for his body typical of a young boy He might try to squash through there. Let's see what he does. Just keeping our voice down. I don't want to give him a fright. He's 
going to come right by the car. He's probably three or four yards at most from the car right now. Absolutely no fear just yet. I think we parked at exactly the right distance. Let's see if he decides to use this tree as a bit of cover. No drama. Isn't that just perfect? You know, I find it so amazing how these animals have just accepted us into their lives and as long as we respect them, they respect us. And you can have a magic encounter like we're having right now, we're literally surrounded by elephant on all sides. Not taking a single no. They know we're here, they obviously know we're here. We're in a very big Land Rover. Big aerial that sticks out the top. Cindy, all the way from Florida. Good morning to you. I think it's probably just after mid morning to you. You've asked me what type of eyesight do elephants have? They've got eyesight probably about as good as what we do, to be honest with you. They see about as well as what we do. The eyes, though, instead of ours, which are up and sort of perpendicular to the ground, an elephant's eyes are aimed at his feet and the tip of his trunk on the ground. So to see you, an elephant has to lift his trunk up. You often see it with youngsters that see the car and all of a sudden react to the car. They'll lift their head up and we see it as a threat display. But in actual fact, they're just trying to lift their eyes up to a level where they can see what's going on in front of you. Otherwise, they pretty much are restricted to what's happening at their feet only. As to how good their eyes are, mentioned about as good as ours are. They don't move around a lot at night time. They will move around a lot in full moon nights. Their eyes are not obviously damaged by the bright lights like we enjoy. And they, once the sun goes down and once their eyes get accustomed to the darkness, they, they can move around quite happily in full moon and half moon nights out here if it's clear enough. But on dark moon nights, they tend to stick around in just one place underneath some trees, not moving very far. This elephant coming down into the sand. Old cow, not the matriarch, the matriarch has moved off. Very little noise for there being 20 or 30 elephant around us, I must be honest. Oh no, not that many. I've, I've counted 15. Right, we know where these illies are. What I want to try and do is we've given them now some time for this animal that was giving that bushbuck a fright probably about 10 minutes ago now to move out of this thick area that we have off to our left and our right hand side. What I want to try and do is try and just get in front where we can access this thicket and see if we can't see anything. See if we can pick up what made that bushbuck get such a fright. Now, in my opinion, it can only really be a leopard at about 11.30 at Vuyatilla Pan. I was hearing the monkeys calling. And now, the bushbuck was calling. It makes me think there's a leopard that's busy moving down this drainage line. All right. and while I go and stick my face into these bushes over here, Jamie is not praying, but she has found something that has a religious bent to it. See you later. So we find ourselves on a top of a termite mound in the last place that shadow was seen. Now the first thing I did before I climbed said termite mound was actually just double check that she wasn't hiding on the other side, which is the last thing one wants to see when one sort of summits over the top of a termite mound only to find yourself faced with an angry leopard on the other side. I can't see any sign of her and I actually figured that this really steep termite mound might be 
the best way of trying to get a view of her. On the way, I picked up this praying mantis that has been designed specifically to look like a blade of grass. It's absolutely incredible how well designed this animal's camouflage is. And if it hadn't moved, I would never have known that it was there. And actually when I grabbed it, well I didn't grab it, I let it walk onto my hand, but then when I tried to keep it in my hand, it used incredibly sharp front legs that's got sort of protrusions on the end, almost spurs on the end of its legs, that it then dug into my skin quite spectacularly. Oh, sorry buddy. Trying to show you them from an interesting angle. Wonder if the guests are going to spot me. Nope, <laughs> the guests didn't spot me. I don't think anybody spotted me. Vehicle just drove straight past. Bye. I can see them relatively clearly. Now, I'm going to pop our friend back here onto the grass where he belongs, and he will completely disappear once I. No, you silly thing. He wants to stay on my hand. There you go. There you go. He's even got the built-in sway to look like he's blowing in the grass. And I'm going to try and figure out. Now I've got up. I'm not entirely sure how to get down. There's a slight problem. I'm really, I mean, I would love to go down this way, but on the one hand, I might fall down. In the negative. In the positive, I might fall down. But the, this way is much easier. <laughs> so bear with me one second, because I think I'm going to go down this way. I think at far less risk of grievous injury. If I wasn't the only remaining guide apart from Steph here on the property, I might be more cavalier with my safety. Oh my goodness. Uh-oh. I'll be with you in a moment. Ugh. Beautifully controlled. It would have been great fun if I'd gone careering off the termite mound into shadow, but don't worry, I did check that she wasn't around. I don't know where she is. She's obviously moved off. I haven't seen her tracks coming out. Jandre, very, very well spotted on his part, managed to pick up on her track, or a track, I think it's actually her cub's track, moving north. But it could also have been where they came in when she got when she made this kill, whatever this kill was. Never found that out either. So I think it's safe to say that she's not here, having done a very thorough examination from the top of a termite mound. She's definitely not around. Okay, let's try get out of here now. Navigating our way around. It's a bit tricky. Very easy to find where the sighting was though Because there's very clear tracks of the vehicles coming off-road here There's her tracks Uh, Dina has said it is so cool that she's been shopping in Rwanda on top of a termite mound with me, shopping in Rwanda with Brent, and, and watching all of this from the safety of the comfort of California. And it's wonderful to hear, Dina. I've just picked up on the tracks. Sorry, distraction now. You're right, it's the joy of, oh my goodness, it is the joy of Safari Live and the Safari Live experience. I'll show you where it is now, Jandre. So she did go towards that termite mound, which was sort of what I suspected might be her next move. This is, this is her track here. I don't know if it's hers or her cubs. It starts, there's, the leopard cub tracks start to get almost the size of an adult very quickly. They're kind of like puppies with big feet that they need to grow into. Oh, the wind's blowing now. I keep thinking I hear her scuffling off away from us, but it's not her. Are these tracks? There's one, there's two, and there's the rest of them hidden beneath my vehicle tracks. <laughs> these tracks are very, very fresh, but we know that because we know she was here this morning. And her toes are pointing me straight back towards that termite mound. 
Her front foot is here, this is her back foot. Walking in this direction. I actually think this is her cub's track. But where did she take her cub from here? Perhaps, been barking up the wrong tree, perhaps she's decided to move the cub to the safety of Juma and her favorite block on Juma around the Balanites tree. But at some point, little cub I think went up that termite mound because let's face it, if I couldn't resist climbing it, if you're a leopard cub, I imagine that the appeal must be pretty much the same thing. I'm going to go search for the leopard cub in the meantime. Let's go over to Steph and find out what he's up to. Ooh. All right, you've caught us here looking for whatever gave Bushbuck a fright. And I mean, we are right in the thick of things over here. There's no tracks of anything in the riverbed as I have it. That doesn't mean much. Very little likes to walk in the sand because it's so difficult to actually get around. But they definitely love... They definitely love the banks of these riverbeds and drainage lines. And they absolutely love to lie in the shade in the trees that these riverbeds provide. Bit of a trick to driving in sand like this. You just got to keep your momentum going and not drive too quick. Ah, there you go. Now that herd of elephant that we were just with, they now around our sides, around our flanks. I've seen leopard frequent these drainage lines all the years that I've been working in the Sabi sands. a special feeling when you come in here. There's always this sense of anticipation. You're just waiting for something to be around the next bend. Now the trick is to drive and listen and drive and listen. Thank you, Genevieve, all the way from New York. You've just uh, paid me a compliment and asked a question. You said, I've, I've uh, got in high enthusiasm for what I do. And your question was, how do I keep that? Uh, Genevieve, quite simply, I find this piece of bush fascinating. I, I love what I do. I love being able to impart knowledge. And through this medium, it's just the most fantastic way. Um, and I love uncovering new things, putting my mind to work in this type of environment, with the puzzles that we get set in this type of environment. Where's this leopard? What's that animal doing? What's this insect? How is it behaving? How does it fit into the greater scheme of things out here? All those questions sort of burn at me. I love them. So that sort of keeps me going. And the fact that you can produce a wonder in somebody is another thing that I love just being able to be part of. You can get someone honestly to go, wow, I didn't even know that. That's basically it really, nothing too complex. <laughs> All right, now what I want to do here, if there were no tracks over here, I just want to listen a little bit. We're going to listen together. And the trick with that is that no animal moves through the bush here without leaving a little bit of the sign of its passage, whether it's by footprints or whether it's by disturbing the area around it. Almost every animal out, out here disturbs or changes the bush around it in some way. And if you're perceptive, if you're sensitive to that, you can pick up on those changes and you can locate what you're looking for. In this particular case, leopard are quite scary. A lot of animals don't like leopard because they get eaten by them and so would give alarm calls as that leopard's moving through the bush. Birds will chitter in a specific way, move from the ground up. Monkeys will chatter, bushbuck, nyala, kudu, whatever is in this particular area, elephant trumpeting, all that will give us an idea that there's one of these great cats that are lurking around here. And by switching off the engine, 
Here we go. What's that? Was that a branch? Chad says it was another vehicle. Possibly. <laughs> More than likely. It sounded like a monkey that just started to chatter there. Alright, I think let's carry on a little bit more. Let's see what else we can find here. So just by being sensitive to these changes and by understanding what they mean, and we learn, I learn more every day, different bird calls that mean different things, the different alarm calls that squirrels give, monkeys give, bushbuck give, all of it has a language. I might be carrying some bushes with me. Let's take a turn up here. And see if anything has walked on the sand here. These cars are truly amazing things. As much as what they give me grey hairs, the few hairs that I have on my head, they turned grey by these cars, not quite knowing what they're going to do next. <laughs> They are superb vehicles off-road, off-tar-road in, in an environment like this. All right, let's see what's going on over here. Well, while we comb the area here, Stopping and listening and stopping and listening, and hopefully we'll be able to uncover something here for you. It'd be good for Jamie to have a chance to give you an update on what she's up to there in Arethusa. Oh, we have an elephant that has decided that he wants to hide behind the tree. Unfortunately, he's in some very difficult light, but he is going to keep walking along the side of us. Hello, boy. Yeah, young bull, all on his own, just at that age, probably a couple of years since he left the safety of his herd, but still not at that age where he feels comfortable and confident to be all by himself. A little bit nervous, wants to move away from us. Hello, boy. as he nibbles away on whatever grass he can find. Let me try and reposition so we've got the sun a little bit on our side. And Desiree, just speaking of our elephants, actually, I'm going to answer Desiree's question first because this is quite a good way of demonstrating exactly what it is, or the best way to tell the difference between a male and a female. Desiree, weirdly, it's actually the obvious isn't always so obvious, especially when you're looking at this kind of view of an elephant, especially when you're looking at them from behind, because of course an elephant, oh, boy, <laughs> taken sudden objection to us closely examining him. So the elephant's testicles are internal and generally the penis is tucked away inside a sheath which means that telling the difference is actually quite tricky. So what you're looking for is a V shape to the flap of skin between the back of the elephant's legs rather than a sort of a straight almost square shape of the females. The males also have rounded foreheads They've got a more round profile. The females have quite an angular profile. So what I mean by that is the sort of the top of their head is flat and then they've got quite a sharp angle that leads down to the top of their nose. Whereas the males are quite, it, it's, it's a lot more bulbous almost. It's tricky though because sometimes you get young males where their, their foreheads haven't quite filled out and adopted the sort of angular approach or the, the round approach that they will have as adults. So they kind of have the, give the impression of being young females. And then one of the other big ways that you want to have a look at, it's again, you can't really, each individual elephant has their own individual set of tusks. 
But if you look at the male tusks, they tend to be thicker, not necessarily longer, but they tend to be thicker um, and for their length than the females do. The females tend to have quite, if they have long tusks, they tend to be quite thin. It's difficult, though, when the elephants are young. That's going to be the hardest time to tell the difference between a male and female. And that's why the first, to first thing I told you about was the shape of the genitals between the back legs. Otherwise, you're going to really struggle. With adult females as well, they have quite, quite well-developed mammary glands between their front legs. In males, they have, males have nipples between their front legs, but they're very, very small and underdeveloped. The mammary glands of the females are slightly more rounded and they look, they give an almost fuller impression, which makes sense because of course they are responsible for the lactation of that animal. Okay, I'm going to try, I've obviously left the area, not completely left the area, but I've obviously moved away from the area where the tracks were for shadow sighting. And we're going to try one more circuit just to see if perhaps I've missed where she's popped out. Otherwise we'll move on a little bit and we will return back towards the end of the evening. And it does seem as though she's got her cub with her so we can't spotlight the little cub. We don't want to add an extra level of distraction to it in it, at a time of its life when it is at its most vulnerable. She could be hiding absolutely anywhere in the shade at this point, in this in this block itself. And the one thing Shadow sometimes does is she slinks away from you as you drive along. If she doesn't want to be seen, then she just isn't. I'm going to concentrate on one more loop around to see what we can see. In the meantime, let's find out how Steph's search of the drainage line is going and whether or not he's found out the source of the bushbuck's discomfort. I haven't yet, and I place major effort on the word yet. We haven't even found a track or a hair of what was made. I haven't even found that bush buck. That's how little of what is disturbing these animals I found. But they're just this feeling around here. What else to put it? But we, what we're not going to do is get sucked into it again, like we have been for the last couple of days. And we are going to carry on. And I want to go down to Twin Dams just in case whatever we're looking for has managed to stay in front of this wave of elephant that we've been with and keeps on moving. If I think about it, if it's the same animal that was making the monkeys upset at 11.30 and now two and a half hours later or three hours later has made a bushbuck upset here, about an hour or so he's going to be able to come down to Twin Dams or she's going to be able to come down to Twin Dams. Very similar to Shadow and Jamie's prediction that, or no statement that she's difficult to find. Karula is equally difficult to find. Older leopard get quite wily in their ways and they definitely know that to walk on a road means that they get found a little bit easier by safari cars. And for an animal that's programmed to stay hidden and stay secretive and to stay secluded, you know, having a big noisy Land Rover crashing around behind you absolutely disturbs their mojo a little bit. And I think that the more wily they become, the more they realize where and where, where and where not, they get disturbed easier. They're definitely clever enough for that, that's for sure. Ah, Erin Richard, you've asked me which is my favorite leopard and why. I think if I had to choose a favorite leopard, it would probably have been Kunuma. Um, for those of you who don't know who Kunuma is, it's a male leopard, the last litter that Karula just had, the dominant female leopard in this particular area. Before she has her previous cubs, she managed to bring two boys into maturity on her own, and one of the two brothers was called Kunuma. And he was my favorite leopard because a, he was easy to find. He had a real confidence about him and would always sit in trees. He also 
liked to hunt a wide variety of things and was quite a good hunter. And I liked his attitude. He had an attitude that didn't brook disrespect. And by disrespect, I mean he definitely let you know when you were disrespecting him. If you, for instance, drove straight at him with your headlights straight at him, you'd quite often elicit a growl and a snarl and a hiss. If you got too close to him, he'd growl and snarl and hiss at you. And I like that. I like that in a leopard. I like it when a leopard lets you know when you're overstepping your boundary. It's really the only way that we know what we're doing is right or what we're doing is wrong is feedback from these animals. And true to nature, humans always push that boundary that little bit closer, that little bit thicker, that little bit closer. And with Kanuma, I enjoyed the fact that he was letting, he let you know when he didn't like you there or when he was having a bad hair day. And for that reason, he's probably my favorite leopard out here. And I miss not seeing the guy. That said, I've seen many leopards come and go over the years and I can't wait to see what the two new characters develop or how the two new characters develop with, uh, with Karula's new babies and new litter, which is a male and a female. They will be vastly different in, in their characters. And Shadow's little one, I can't wait to see what Shadow's little one turns into. We're all holding thumbs that, it is, that, she's, that she's successful this time. And what new males bring around? What's going to happen to this Sindile? Where is he going to go? Why is he not moving off? Why is he not behaving? Like every other leopard we've ever met before. Why is he coming and hanging around here? We want to know what happens there. Who's going to replace him, Vula? Which young male is going to come in and eventually fight off the mature male in Vula here? Will we see Anderson again? Is Tingana going to set up territory here or somewhere else? You know, all these questions just keep sort of keep me interested in... Uh, in the what next? We've just got a Land Rover coming towards us. Ah, there we go. Hello. Now, we don't normally show them, so I'm just going to quickly greet them. I'll be out of shot for a little bit. Hello, everybody. How are you? Good. We are live, so we won't be able to talk for too long. But that bush buck was calling literally 200 meters or so in this direction. I don't know what it is. And in 1130, I heard monkeys at Voyatella. So I think there's something moving down this drainage line. Three. All right. See you in a bit. Okay. Got them. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your patience, everybody. We have a network of guides out here. It's not just ourselves on safari here. This afternoon, there's probably, if I were to take a guess, there's probably five or six guides in this area, a couple of thousand hectares that we're driving around in and we all like to help each other find stuff. So I was just giving them an update on the monkeys that we're calling a little bit earlier this afternoon, as well as the bushbuck we heard when we were with those elephants. What is this? That is a monitor lizard. <laughs> Took me a while there, it looked like a drag mark. So you can see this S Ben in front of us. That is the tail drag mark of a monitor lizard. Looks very much like a snake, but it isn't because there's tracks on the side. You can almost see them just next to every bend. And that was a monitor lizard, one of the largest lizards that we have out here, growing to about seven feet at maximum length. And this monitor lizard was moving from one place to another and just so happened to come onto the road for a bit. Confounded me a little bit in my track and sign identification there. Why I got excited there for a second is because drag marks quite often look quite similar. And a drag mark is when a leopard or a hyena or a lion kills something and moves away from the scene of the crime and moves to another area and they drag and as they walk they dragging and it, it, the, the prey whatever appendage is lying on the floor can sometimes make that funny mark it's a water bucket an enormous water bucket inside there but a little bit too far away for the camera to zoom in on without us having to drive in there 
and we don't really drive off-road for general game species here. We really only try and go off-road for lion and leopard and wild dog. We will go off-road for cheetah as well and it sounds like I'm adding to the list here exponentially. It's really just those few. And now what I'm doing is I'm just scanning this area for some tracks. Let's see if we haven't missed. A bit like a jigsaw puzzle, just trying to put together all the pieces. I'm trying to draw a picture in my mind of this and that. And the next thing, where to find tracks? Where have I seen leopards go before? If this, what leopard is it? Have they walked through here before? It's quite confounding. And then I'm trying to confirm it with tracks. Right, there's nothing that's crossed over here at all. I just had to make doubly sure in the sand. There's been a lot of traffic here in the sand. And that's basically how we find things out here. On these cars, we end up being presenters and trackers at the same time, trying to put all our years of bush knowledge into practical application by finding animals and predicting where they're going to be so that we can show them to you. Sometimes, as is proven the case in the last 48 hours or so, been a bit difficult. So we've just had a request from one of our viewers called Wild Wishes has asked me to detail what the difference is between leopard and lion tracks and then leopard and hyena tracks. Wild Wish is the easiest for me to do that is going to be to show you a picture. So what I'm going to do, if you'd bear with me for two seconds, is just get my book out. It allows us as well, and thankfully so, to switch the car off so that we can listen to the bush around us. So while I am going to show you what you've asked me for. All right. So in general, here is a cheetah, three even lobes at the back, but with claws. And we've got a bunch of birds that have just been given a massive, excuse me for getting distracted, but we've got a Franklin that's giving alarm calls. We've got go away birds that are giving alarm calls all around us. And I'm just trying to ascertain whether or not it's a hunting bird. Right, I think let's quickly see if we can go and I want to go and follow up quickly on those alarm calls on those go away birds quickly and let's just see I'll I will come back to you right now the answer is right here it's very easy to do but let us quickly go and see what was causing that disturbance those birds will only shout for a little bit and then they will stop And that gives us a window of opportunity that we absolutely need to try and address here. So let's go this way. Picking up the speed a little bit just because it was on the other side I'm of so this drainage uh... line. Not far away at all. Right. Here. Hornball chattering. is the area now so now what we're going to try and do is find here we've got some birds not the birds that we're giving the alarm call though now birds will react to leopard leopard hunt birds when they're young and when they're cubs they absolutely take birds and birds react instinctually to leopard moving through an area that panic that we heard there franklin giving an alarm call boom and go away birds all of a sudden shouting go away they absolutely would do that to a leopard. So let's just go to this junction here and then we will switch off again and see if we can see anything. Oh, it's just such a lot of luck 
I hope you all out there are holding your thumbs and wishing for a spotted cat. The more of you out there that we have wishing for something to happen, the better. Let's just switch off here. See if I can hear anything. Alarm calls have stopped. Anyway, let's get back to our answering the question and see what we can come up with. So there's a cheetah track, three lobes at the back, and that's cat-like, but with claws, cheetah. Three lobes at the back, without claws, leopard. Slightly bigger, three lobes at the back, but a little bit more amorphous is the lion. And then hyena have two lobes at the back, two with claws, and these funny shaped toes. They have this very bean shaped toe. You can see it there and there. So two lobes in the sand plus claws plus this bean shaped toe is a hyena. Three lobes, no claws is a leopard. Three lobes, no claws could also be a lion. The only difference is, is that even a small lion still has a bigger paw than a big male leopard. I hope that helped you. To try and give you an idea of how big this is, leopard, a big male leopard track will be about this big, about that wide, so filling up there. A big male lion track will be bigger than my hand, and that's the size difference between a male lion or lion and a leopard. Big male leopard and big male lion. So much bigger. I hope that helped you there with that question. Right, we still have absolutely no idea what it is that's disturbing everything here. We just know that it's some disturbance is happening here. There's a, that big water buck has come out that we can have a look at. Let's have a look at him so long. He's actually a magnificent creature. Not often that we see large male water buck out here. And he's busy looking at us through the bushes there. He was a bit far away just now when we passed. Have a look at that. Impressive, hey? He's busy watching us at the moment. I have no doubt he came to investigate what those birds were making a noise about, and that's why he's stopped moving. There he's now moving on, an enormous bull. He'd probably weigh in the region of about 500 pounds, 250 kilograms. Great big shaggy coat, huge horns used for both defense and offense. A defense in terms of lion and leopard, offense in terms of fighting other male water buck for dominance over females. Have a look at those horn tips. Imagine something weighing 500 pounds running at you with those sharp horn tips. It might actually come out in front of us here. Let's see if we can move a bit forward. He's well worth a screenshot, so for those of you at home and who like this type of thing, get ready to get yourself a screen grab of this particular water buck. He is definitely a big one for this area, a majestic male. Let's see if we can get this water buck coming through here. To me, has he stopped? Doesn't look like he stopped. He's still coming this way. I don't know if he's past us or not. Still behind us. Alright, let's go and turn around and get the sun out of our face. I think that's the first thing that we're going to do. And we'll see if he comes into these clearings over here. Just turn around here in front. Got these illies in the open as well here. Let's see what they're up to. We'll get into a position, maybe we can get a double whammy. What a buck and an elephant. <laughs> 
Jeremiah Green has just asked me, what is the weirdest animal that I've ever seen on safari? Uh, Jeremiah, I presume you are thinking about something quite exotic um, and big, amorphous that we get to see. And then I'd have to say that the weirdest animal that I find currently is probably a giraffe. I just, I'm battling to get it into my mind about how bizarre a giraffe actually is, the actual animal of a giraffe. In terms of the weirdest animal I've ever seen in my life, that has to be insects. They just sometimes come out with sizes and shapes and forms that baffle my absolute imagination to try and understand how they got there, why they evolved into this particular shape or form, what they're busy doing in that niche, how they hunt, how they know how to get there. All those questions tend to drive me a bit dilly at times. So no real single one, there's been many of them. <laughs> Let's see, I want to show you this picture here of this young male elephant having a sundowner with his legs crossed. No, he's going to move off. Oh, of course, just because I wanted to show it to you. Now these elephants have moved into the open, which allows me to show you this massive matriarch, or what I believe to be the matriarch anyway. She's in front here. I'm wondering if that water bucket is going to walk past us. I hope so. I'm just taking it easy. Yeah, this big elephant cow is. She is just absolutely beautiful. Have a look at this lady. Oh, hello ma'am. Full respect to you. Giant, have a look at how her tusks have been stained by the generations of trees that she's been eating. All that is vegetable staining. The juices and the tannins. She's got beautiful tusks. Look how she's using that tusk. Bending the branch. <laughs> The calf is scratching himself. Michelle, elephants have tusks because they use them to feed with. You can see that this particular female has what we call a slave tusk. Have a look at that. She will use that tusk every time. She's learned how to use it, almost like a left or a right hand. Have a look at how short it is compared to the other one. She's worn it into almost a chisel. They use it for defense. They can thrust with their tusks generally at one another and females will thrust with their tusks towards males that are getting a little bit too impatient and at other females that are giving their babies a little bit of a hassle also at predators but mainly it's a tool I would say rather than having any one function it's a tool it's a multi-tool you can see there she's Definitely using that tusk to great effect on what is none other than a sickle bush, which is an incredibly hardy species of plant. Here we go, using that slave tusk again. I think she's the matriarch. She's definitely the biggest cow here. She is just absolutely wonderful. That's her calf in tow, a couple of years old, already eating vegetation. She, she looks like she's still got milk, so I would say that he's probably close to two years old, this calf. Not quite there just yet, not far off though. Oh, it's fantastic spending this time with these elephants, I must be honest with you. Let's see if we can... Watch this calf a little bit longer. That's a fallen leadwood that he's busy eating. They're not generally a food tree for young elephants like this. What's happened is previously in the wet, this tree has been pushed over, but its roots were not broken, and now the tree is growing upright. Up, its branches are growing upright towards the sun again. 
amazing ability of the trees out here. In particular, the Combretum genus displays that ability of being able to be knocked down and still keep on growing. Wow, we've got a lot of elephant coming towards us now. I think we'll let's see if we can get a little bit more forward. We've got some elephant going to move into the open here with the sunlight. It's just absolutely fantastic. And they're going to come into the open here. And there's a tiny little calf. That elephant coming into your picture on the left-hand side. She's got a tiny little baby. Let's see, there we go, there he pops out. Hello. Hello, little guy. Can't see his tusks yet, and that means that he's below a year old. He's using his trunk. That tells me that he's above six months old. They can't really use their trunk at less than six months. Look at his little bottom lip open, sucking on whatever he's put in his mouth. <laughs> oh, that's cute, man. Wow. Walking with his mom. He, if you stood up next to the wall, he's probably just below hip height. That's how big he is at the moment. A tiny little guy. Probably mid-thigh. Oh, that's cute. That female's just pushed that youngster away from the bush. Her time to eat. It's the same herd that we had a little bit earlier on today. The same herd that I saw from my phone call at around about 11 o'clock. I haven't moved very far, probably about two miles, if I were to guess. I tracked them just before we went live today, and they definitely went to Voyatella to go and have a drink. It's actually quite amazing. There's a few really nicely tusked elephants. Here comes this matriarch across the road in front of us. You can see her shoulder blades are quite skinny. She is the custodian of the knowledge in this particular herd. She knows where to go when it's dry. She knows where to go when it's wet. She knows what to do in danger. She knows where the crossings are, where the first trees are to get the nicest fruit. She is, and she knows everything. And she's imparting that knowledge to all the elephant that are younger than what she is. And they have got very, very good memories for that type of thing. There's an old saying about elephant never forgetting, and that is very true. I've got a very good recollection for smell. I don't quite know what she's waiting for there. I think it, it's her baby's drinking. Have a look at the feet. You'll see the baby is drinking from her. She's busy nursing at the moment. She's got her one foot forward, and her baby's standing perpendicular to her. The baby's nursing from her right hand side and she's just waiting for him to have some milk. There we go. And he's now let go. Just a quick mouthful, nothing more than that. And then moving off to feed again. Right. Jamie's also seems to have some elephant that have just arrived at Arethusa Dam. Enjoy. Elephants that have just arrived at Arethusa Dam. A mixture of all, great and small, and quite a few small. <laughs> Little ones hiding behind the safety of mum. These poor elephants that have come sprinting towards Arethusa Dam are about to find themselves severely disappointed because there is very very little water left but I think that these elephants actually have a trick up their sleeve as they parade past the Arethusa Lodge 
I don't think they were aiming for this dam at all the entire time. I think they've got something else planned. Because watching them now, they're all making a beeline straight over the dam wall. Just have a look here. Oh, hello, girl. Giving us her nose up look. It's all right. I've been sitting here the whole time. You just came running towards me. I can't have taken you that much by surprise. Oh, shame. Poor disappointed little one. Thought it was going to get a drink. Now, they actually can't even risk taking that young one to the water's edge. First of all, there's hardly... Oh, shame. Reaching up for connection with Mom. First of all, there's hardly any water in the Arethusa Dam. And second of all, it would actually risk getting stuck. Now, this brave soul or thirsty soul, has desperately decided that it's worth the risk to try and lean forward into the mud and drink from there. Oh, this is so tragic to watch. It really is. Shame, boy. That didn't work out so well, did it? I think he's realized that there's no way that that is going to work. Another wading into the mud to try and get in there. These are the young bulls that are desperately trying. He's going to dig his way through, pushing underneath the mud. Oh, shame. It's so deep. He'll be okay. The elephants of this size won't get stuck. All right, Mommy. I'm just sitting here. Relax. It's okay. I'm just sitting. Oh, shame. Stressed animals. It's okay, girl. I could actually almost see, see the confusion. Oh, Chandra, look at this little one. Oh, desperately trying to push its way into the mud. Wait, everybody, wait. Oh, all it's come away with instead of a comforting drink has just been a face full of thick, smelly mud. Oh, shaking the last of his mud off his feet. It would be comic, except for the fact that it really isn't. If it were a different scenario, it would be very funny watching them shake the mud off their feet. But right now, it's just incredibly sad. It's okay, Elise. That being said, these elephants will have... Hello. What have you got to say for yourself, apart from that you brought your dinner with you to, to your drinking water hole? <laughs> Eating on the run, are we? Better go catch up with the ladies. Oh, don't be full of nonsense. Yes, take your sickle bush. Take your sickle bush. It's like carrying a packed lunch. Really incredible elephant sighting. I do think that the wise females of this particular herd, I think they've got a trick up their sleeve. I think they're going to go to some of the piped areas behind the lodge, and I think they're going to go and dig up their water. I think they've got a secret supply of water somewhere around the back in that drainage line. Although, I, I mean, these, these elephants are far more fortunate than the hippopotamus and so on, since they can actually walk to the next water source and there are pumped areas there are the the various lodges and the various pieces of land will continue to pump water holes for them to keep them to give the animals water in this area so they won't at no point will these animals not be able to drink throughout this dry season at least for now we've just got to hope that this wet season changes everything and that we get the rain that we need to replenish the dams and also the under, underground water sources. Shall we go and investigate what these elephants are doing on the other side of the dam wall? Because the females didn't even glance very much. Well, they sort of glanced sideways at the dam and then carried on determinedly in that direction. I want to go and see what's got them so interested. I suspect they've got water somewhere there. I'm going to go and investigate.
Now speaking of the drought and our various elephants, sorry, I want to just grab something quickly before I get onto this question. It's beautiful and I think it's, oh, it's definitely worth grabbing quickly. Any Ellie's I should know about? Oh, good thing our handbrake works so incredibly well. <laughs> Whee! The handbrake's on, by the way. <laughs> Let's try that again, shall we? Use the gears instead. Okay, are we gonna stay now? Thank you, Rusty. I'm just gonna grab, jump out and grab this. And Paul, for now, it seems as though the female elephants are managing to feed their youngsters in the drought. It's gonna get more and more difficult for them and some, not all of them, are managing. We saw one with Brent a couple of months ago, I think it was, where a female wasn't able to produce the milk that her baby need and needed. And that poor little baby died a couple of days later on Torchwood. So it does happen. Sorry, I just thought this feather was too beautiful for words. I wonder if it came from the fish eagle that flies around here. It is straight into the sun for Jandre, but it is so beautiful. Mottled is the only way of describing that. Beautifully mottled. Much like my skin was after painting Final Control this afternoon. Our new Final Control, that is. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? It's filaments and it's fringes. Hmm. Stunning. I'm going to keep that, I think. Yes, I know I'm going to keep that. I'm going to put it safely in my box. Right, while we go and catch up with the elephants, let's go across to Steph for an update on his side. Hi, welcome back. We, uh, we've left the river area with those elephants and we are now trying to hopscotch around the block to Twin Dams. I want to go and have a look at what's going on around Twin Dams because I feel that perhaps we've missed the opportunity and this leopard has walked literally past us while we've, uh, while we've been watching the elephants and while we've been deciding on what to do. I don't know why I'm feeling like that. It's just there's just not that much energy around there anymore. It could literally just be me doing that though. So I not take what I say as any sort of backing scientific backing whatsoever oh it's building up to be quite an afternoon i must be honest with you nice clear skies that wind seems to the wind we had this morning seems to have cleared off a lot of the dust although there is it is still quite diffused i think we are going to be having a red sunset tonight rather than a golden one I do think it's going to be a very pretty sunset. I'm coming through an area that's also frequented by a lot of different things. Elephant love this area. Ah, Jamie's got a juvenile fish eagle to show you. See you in a bit. I suspect that our, oh my goodness, and I think if we needed any further proof, he is currently, or he or she is currently providing it, I suspect that this is the previous owner of that feather before it was passed to me. Uh, it is a juvenile fish eagle. It hasn't yet acquired its adult plumage, but is in the process of molting. Oh, bye. That was a juvenile fish eagle. Wow, Jandre, awesome. And now, actually, if we reposition, we can actually get a view of both the, the juvenile and the adult. Just hold on one moment. We'll go and get them both. So the juveniles of birds of prey can take up to seven or eight years to get their adult plumage. They spend their sort of initial first years of life, of their adult, uh, sub-adult life, with very mottled, usually quite drab plumage. They look very, very different from their adult form which is completely fascinating. So, 
for a nice comparison purpose, and I'm really hoping they don't go anywhere, if I think if I go any closer they will, we've got an adult on the left hand side and a juvenile on the right. Now here is the juvenile, <laughs> still with that flapping, oh, shame, I always want to go and grab it from him, help him out a little bit. And then we've got the adult fish eagle on the left. Such a treat to see these extraordinarily beautiful birds. One that is so stereotypical of Africa, I think. Was that was a bush buck. Did you hear that? That deep boar. Right. Let's see if it does it again. Let's just see if it does it one more time. Because it might have barked. It wasn't actually a bush buck. I'm sorry, it was an Anyala. It was too deep for a bush buck. Might even have been a kudu, that deep woo, sound. Before we go racing off, it was just one call. Now, sometimes what happens is they get a fright. Either people or perhaps an elephant chases it or chased it, which could well have happened. Ah, oh, look at this. Ah. Oh. I was so hoping it was going to land on the same branch, provide us with an incredible image, but... Oh, come on, Rusty. Oh, come on. You roll when I don't want you to, and you don't when I do. Okay, I have to start up. I'm not racing in the direction of that bark, because I'm not sure that it wasn't just a Nyala getting chased by an elephant and giving off a deep, booming bark in panic more than anything else. But I will go and investigate once we've finished with our... Fish eagle, ah, oh. just, just can't get them both in the same shot here. Hmm, hmm. Oh dear. Sort of. Almost. Let's give you a really nice glimpse of the difference between the adult on the right and the juvenile on the left now, with that silly flapping loose feather. That must be so irritating. Come on, give your wings a good shake. Might help. <laughs> Flapping in the wind. Oh, that must be so irritating. There he goes. Oh, there goes the adult. I don't know where it's heading to. And the juvenile will probably follow suit relatively soon. Thank you all for sending through your stunning screenshots of these beautiful birds. They really are so picturesque, sort of. This guy is maybe not quite so photogenic just yet. I mean, he's still pretty, but that loose flapping feather just isn't doing wonders for his look. It's the equivalent of that awkward teenage stage with braces and pimples that our juvenile fish eagle is currently going through. <laughs> I'm so desperate for that feather to fall off. It just looks so out of place. Also be very nice to go and add to my new collection of juvenile fish eagle feathers, a collection that I have recently just started, believe it or not. <laughs> Giving it a, a sort of sideways look. Come on, please pluck it out with your beak. It really looks, it's, it's like a loose tooth. It really looks like it needs to go now. Of course those feathers are embedded in their skin. So it's only when they naturally fall out that it doesn't hurt the bird. To pull the bird's feathers out would hurt. But that's obviously irritating. But it's probably just not quite got to that point where it's ready to go. And you can imagine how solid the rooting system of flight feathers have to be, or has to be, in order to prevent them from falling out under the force of that, well, that the bird undergoes during flight. 
Their feathers are so essential to their survival, they have to be deeply rooted underneath the skin. That one's driving me mad. It's upsetting my sense of order. <laughs> it really, truly is. <laughs> Shame. Poor bird. All right. Well, I think we'll leave our poor juvenile fish eagle to his adolescent woes and go and search to see what, perhaps what upset that Nyala, but also I'm still curious to see what was on the mind of those elephants when they went racing off down into this drainage line. Because they went off with a very determined atmosphere, or very determined air to their body language. The deep bark came from somewhere here. And Laura in Alabama, don't think I didn't think about it. Just sitting, waiting around, Laura suggested that if I wait around, I might have another feather to add to my collection. I most definitely would. Ah, I think I was absolutely right. Sorry, this is not the clearest view. <laughs> Did you guys find a water pipe by any chance? So, for those of you planning your next safari trip and you would like to be up close and personal with elephants, um, here is a view from an Arethusa guest room. We are sitting outside looking in towards the lodge. That is one of the guests' bedrooms, presumably. I mean, I assume. I don't actually know the layout that well. But uh, just, you know, imagine going out for your afternoon sundowner, not really paying attention to what's going on around you, opening up your balcony door, only to find yourself eye-level with a couple of giant creatures. And that is exactly what the clever females of that herd had in mind. They've come through to dig up a pipe and have a drink. And I'm sure that's what the bushbuck bark was, I mean, sorry, the Nyala bark was about as well. <laughs> Gently swishing tails of the elephants as they seek out the water pipe. And I'm not sure what some of them are doing but I bet they're up to mischief and perhaps depositing a present for the guest when they get back from their afternoon safari or a couple of large presents for the guests when they come back from their afternoon safari okay in that case having solved two of our mysteries I think we're going to carry on for now we'll send you back across to Steph I might watch this for a little bit longer but I'll send you back across to Steph to find out what his plans are for the rest of the afternoon <laughs> Welcome back all the way from Arethusa right to where we are. We're pretty much right on the other side of where you are of our traverse, right probably, I don't know, 10 miles or more away from Jamie. And he just sort of in a flash came to us. Amazing, hey? Now, we are about to approach Twin Dams from the southern side. And I'm hoping that somewhere in the middle we bump into whatever's been disturbing these animals for the afternoon. Now, I know it's pretty thin me thinking we're going to find a leopard just because I've heard one bushbuck call and a monkey call um, six or seven hours ago. But you know, it's all we've really got to go on at the moment. I'm using that hunch to build an entire case from. Literally two clues and I've told you it's a leopard already, where we're going to find it and how we're going to look at it. And I don't know, it is a little bit of guesswork from my side, but nevertheless, I stay optimistic. Oh. I tell you, we were just busy having a chat had to myself about what we expect is going to be the event horizon here. At what point 
are we going to see animals with not enough energy to stand up to keep the fight going? Which will happen at some point. It does happen. It has happened already. In some parts of the country, animals literally don't have enough energy to stand up and keep on eating. They just have run out of it. And at that point, it's just a matter of time. Now, drought is natural. Of course, it's natural. As it's, natu it's as natural as flooding is. It's as natural as fires are. It's just a necessary part of maintaining the balance out here. There's no such thing as an equilibrium. It's all just part of the flow of things. And drought is just one of those things. Only the fittest and the most able will survive. And the areas that are marginal, they lose animals so that they don't get overgrazed and they don't get overutilized. So that when the good times do come, those areas can support animals again. <laughs> I've just heard that those Ellie's are in Arethusa's garden and that's a sight that you can't miss. So back you go to Jamie and her elephant. <laughs> the Ellie's are still in Arethusa garden and Giandre has managed to solve the mystery even further. It's a splash pool. It is a guest's splash pool that they are currently drinking from. And it just goes to show how clever these elephants really are. And they've managed to find their way. They've learned that, and I promise you, I bet you they would only try this on game drive time or during game drive time when they know that the guests are not going to be in the room and that a lot of the staff will be busy setting up for dinner and so on. They probably even time it, although that might be a bit of a stretch, but they may well time it to avoid the staff members who are busy doing the turn down of the beds. Look, she's drinking from a splash pool. I know it's really difficult to see. I don't think there's a better position that I can get for you. But that is seriously enterprising. And one certainly cannot begrudge them their opportunity to have a long drink at a little splash pool. <laughs> and that's a lovely message coming through from Bonnie Clifford. It's wonderful to have you, Bonnie, and I hope you're enjoying watching Arethusa from a slightly different angle. Now, apparently, when Bonnie Clifford was staying at Arethusa last year, she found herself with a pile of elephant dung right outside the bedroom. And I think that might be a fairly rel a relatively regular experience at the Arethusa Lodge. This is not the first time I've stopped on our live safaris and spoken about the elephants right next to the windows. This is, however, the first time I have ever shown them on camera drinking from a splash pool. That is a first. The guests are going to, oh, even the little baby can reach over. The guests are going to come back. There's going to be no water in their swimming pool. Or there's going to be half a swimming pool and a thin layer of elephant saliva floating on the top. I wonder if they've spread themselves out throughout the guest rooms. <laughs> a little bit of Ellie backwash for your nightly swim. Fortunately, it is midwinter, and perhaps they won't be as eager to do so. <laughs> the newest in spa treatments. Ele elephant saliva, guaranteed to make you look... Well, not sure what it's guaranteed to do. So I'm saying saliva. I'm not entirely sure it's just saliva that will make its way into that water. A little bit of mucus as well, I imagine. <laughs> I really, I'm so curious, it's such a pity it's so, th well not a pity, it's the natural lay of the land. It would be nice to see if they've spread themselves out from room to room, because there was a sizable elephant herd that had to come and wait for their turn to drink at one splash. But look at the little trunk reaching up and around. That nice baby. Okay. I think it's probably time to leave our elephants to their splash pool experience. 
and perhaps just leave it to the imagination what the, the guests might discover upon their return after their evening safari. And for us, for all of us, it will be just that little secret. It will be the secret between us and the elephants as to what really happened on a quiet afternoon at Arethusa Lodge during game drive time. Hey, elephants, don't worry. Myself, Chandre, and several hundred people will keep your secret nice and safe with us. While we carry on, let's go back across to Steph and find out how he's doing. I'm doing fine, thank you, Jamie. I hope all of you are doing okay as well. We are finally at Twin Dams, and I'm just taking a moment to listen to the bush around us. So I'm taking a moment to switch off the car, listening to the bush, hearing if I can hear any other disturbance around here. Nothing much. We've been sitting still probably for three or four minutes. I always call it providence. If we were meant to find something, when we switch off, it'll give us the answer. All I'm saying is, come on monkeys, there's a troop of vervet monkeys that live in the forest in front of us, basically in that band over there, and I'm hoping that they start to shout at some point at this leopard. What we could do to expedite the whole process is actually take you for a drive in the dry riverbed, which might actually be quite nice. It's not very often that I drive through the riverbeds. I walk through them very often, but not driving through them. It might be quite nice. Let's go and do that for a change. Don't you just love this ancient jackalberry? This is an enormous tree. One of the tallest trees out here. I'm going to go backwards a little bit so you can get the full majesty of this particular tree, hopefully without my bald head ruining your shot. One giant thing to another, Jamie's got those elephants having tea on the, or high tea on the deck at Arethusa. <laughs> get your cameras ready. <laughs> the elephants have indeed turned up right on time for high tea at Arethusa Lodge and then presented us with this absolutely stunning view. I know that Chandre has been recording some of this. I think we might, we definitely will at some point show it to the Arethusa guys just so they can have a look at what goes on behind the scenes. I think this might be the spa. To be completely honest, I think this might either be a spa pool or a water feature. Either way, right now it is an elephant's drinking spot. Where there's a will, there is a way. As you can see from that little trunk that's desperately trying to reach over the top behind the elephant that we're... Oh, there we go! Yay! And Deborah, armchair traveller, yes, absolutely. All of the pools in this area will be maintained in a way that is safe for the animals to drink so that they're not consuming a huge amounts of chlorine with their drink. And of course, it's not just the elephants that will come through and drink from here. You'll probably find that the leopards often go and have a drink late at night. Maybe even lions, baboons, monkeys, possibly even antelope might be brave enough to sneak in and have a drink there from time to time. So the pools won't be maintained in a way, there will probably even be a natural filtration system. I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure what method it is that they employ here. I know that where I used to work, they set up a wonderful system where it is a sort of an overflow of pool that goes into a natural filtration system built out of reeds and grasses and so on that then filters the water and it gets pumped back into the main body of the pool. And that was because the lions have a tendency to go, well, all the animals have a tendency to go and have a drink from there. Oh, we've got somebody new arriving for their drink. 
That little trunk stretching in there is utterly adorable. I knew they had to have some kind of secret mission. They were clearly thirsty. Oh, little trunk. Oh, having a quick rest on the spa floor. That's going to bear an interesting imprint. Wet trunk mark. This is really stunning. This is definitely a new one for all of us, I think. Certainly a new one for me. At the Arethusa Spa Pool. And Fox Hat has said, an elephant jacuzzi sounds excellent. Where can you book? Well, I'm sure you will be able to find the details, but absolutely. It was one of the things we always wanted to do in the area. Uh, my old job, there was a big concrete reservoir outside of camp, and we used to occasionally, well, we did swim in there until I encountered an entire baboon skull, stepped on it the one afternoon. After that, our swimming trips were limited. But um, one of the things I really wanted to do was blow up one of those tire tubes and go and sit in the middle of the reservoir with an elephant herd coming to drink around me. I think probably they would never have actually approached. Ooh. I think they've been discovered. The secret is out. Or there's another elephant that has caused chaos a little bit further out, I think. Or I actually just think there's some building work going on back there that startled them. I don't think they were actively chased, I just think there was some building work happening. Sorry, Ellies. I interrupted mid-drink. Huh. Well, in that case, I think since our sighting is now over... Or perhaps some brave soul decided they wanted to go to the spa and discovered they were unable to due to the presence of a herd of elephants there. Hello, little one. Did you manage to get a drink as well? Yes. Tip of the trunk wet. of watering eyes for our Ellie's at the moment. Dust in the air. <laughs> Hello girls. You've even managed to get some on your head as well. On an after drink dinner. That dead branch was clearly in the way. All right, Ellie's. Thank you for your wonderful sighting and Harry. I agree. Elephants do never cease to amaze all of us out here. They are incredibly intelligent animals. That was pure problem solving right there. The dam is muddy. The dam is gross. The dam has hardly any water in it. Just mud. Okay, well, we'll go to the pool. We'll go to the plunge pool or the splash pool or whatever it is that's on the deck of the Arethusa Lodge. And go and enjoy a quick drink there. They're very, very clever animals. And it was clearly the females that were leading the way to go and drink from there, and that was clearly the destination that they had in mind. They didn't even really stop to let the young calves even try and drink from the Arethusa Dam. It was only the young males that made brave but half-hearted attempts at drinking from that mud wallow. And then they go into the Tambuerti thicket, pretty much disappearing from view for now. Now, 
M J D N N G O L. M J D N N G O L. I hope that's right. I think that's your username. But M J D N N G O L. Is, is Lou saying D? <laughs> M J B? M J G! M J G. Okay, hold on. I got this. M J G N N girl. M J G N N girl. I've forgotten what your question was completely. Oh, I remember. Will animals feel safer when they come to drink if other ele if elephants are around? Not at the moment, because elephants are actually quite possessive over the water that they are finding. Oh, you want the sunset? Oh, perfect. Okay. So while we open answer M J G N N girl's question, the elephants at the moment are chasing most of the animals away from the waterhole. Um. And they wouldn't necessarily act, necessarily, I mean, act to protect another animal if it were to be attacked by a predator. That being said, there are lots and lots of recorded cases of elephants chasing away other predators. And when there's plenty of water, then yes, the other animals will happily share the water hole with the elephants and feel relatively content in doing so. Just safety in numbers. Any situation where there is the advantage of numbers, animals will feel a greater sense of comfort when they go and drink. And MJG, J, J, MJG, G, N, N, girl, my apologies for my butchering of your name. It was totally unintentional, and I hope that no offense was caused. Beautiful sunset. I think I'm going to leave the elephants for now. <laughs> and while we do, and go off in search of other things and while I attempt to compose myself because I'm going to get the giggles very soon I'm going to send you back across to Steph and find out how he's doing I must say I don't quite get that joke but it's good that Jamie's having a, <laughs> having a bit of a laugh she does get the giggles every now and again and I must be honest when she starts it's very difficult to switch her off and I say that in the fondest possible way what I've decided to do is drive into the sun. I feel like watching the sun set, and I think the closer we get to the sun, I can prolong that sunset. In Well, you could probably prolong it indefinitely, but we'll eventually hit a mountain range, which even this car won't be able to go over. Perhaps if we had Brent in the driving seat, he'd give it a bash. The Drakensberg are a mere hindrance to him in this car. Taking no more effort than to gear down and attempt it with more speed. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a lovely sunset. But I'm going to try and attempt to get a little bit higher so that we can see this beautiful sunset. I've given up my search for whatever was causing that whatever it was causing that disturbance in this drainage line. I'll return when it's dark with a spotlight and we can probe deeper in. But for now, I've had enough driving up and down aimlessly alongside that little piece of, of road. I think that elephant herd we've passed probably for the 20th time since the beginning of the drivers beginning to think there's something wrong with us. Let's go and look for a nice place to have a sunset. Kelly has just asked, how do I know where I'm going when I'm driving around the park because there's no road signs? Kelly, there's, um, every one of these roads have a name and every one of the roads has some or other type of landmark on it that is recognizable by all of us out here. Similar to how you recognize a particular shop or a tree or a garden. That tree, for instance, is a weeping boer bean, a scotia on a termite mound and that's a really big Scotia on a termite mound and that is what we call the Scotia on Weaver's Nest Road. So the road we're going to get to is 
the Scotia Road. Well, the Scotia at Weaver's Nest Road. And this is Weaver's Nest Road. And every other road here has a name. And it takes you a little bit of time to get to know the road names out here. Probably about, I'd say to be comfortable on every single one of the roads out here will take you a year of driving around here like these presenters do. About a year. But what takes a lot longer than that, probably about five years, is to figure out what lies between these roads. So where is the next road? I know it's there somewhere, but what lies between here and the next road? How many drainage lines is between here and there? What animal paths are in the middle? And it's that that takes you such a long time. You literally got to crisscross and zigzag through this area on foot and in a vehicle for years and years to get that right. The road name is not too difficult. What lies between the roads a little bit more so. Oh, we're driving straight into this beautiful sunset. It is lovely. See if we can actually get closer to quarantine. Uh, Lisa has just asked me all the way from, I'm not too sure where. Lisa, feel free to tell us where you're from. Um, it's always interesting to know where these questions come from. You've just asked me, um, at what time does the sun set in winter? I think the earliest the sun sets, and the equinox was literally just the other day on the 21st of, uh, of June. The earliest the sun sets is about 10 past 5, I think. So just after 5 o'clock on this side. And the latest it sets is just after 7 o'clock in summertime, around the summer, e <clears throat> the summer solstice. Not equinox, excuse me, wrong terminology, the solstice. Um, and that is on the 21st of December. The sun is setting here just after 7 o'clock, whereas in winter it's about two hours earlier than that. Let's see if we can race the sun to the top of this hill and see if we can get it. I think we may have missed it. Oh. Let's see, I think we've missed the sunset. I'm just going to pick up the speed a little bit. Ah, no, we haven't missed it. And I might be able to get you a view of the sunset and some zebra, which is exactly what we're going to try and do. I think we're going to miss. Get your screenshots ready. The sun is literally going to set while we're looking at this picture. Let's see if I can get you. No. Gert, where's going to be the best one? Forward. There we go. Let's watch the sunset together with some zebra. See if we can get you a nice picture for your screen savers. There we go. A little bit sticks in the way there, not to worry. It's the best that we've got it at the moment. There we go, lovely. You can count. I don't think that you'll reach 10 before the sun is gone. That's how quickly it sets here. You can start now if you like. And see that ball of blazing yellow gold. I thought it was going to be redder. The wind definitely had a remarkable effect at cleaning away the dust here. Taking a little bit longer than I predicted. <laughs> uh. <clears throat> oh, just so peaceful, Archer. And that is the end of that sunset end of another day out here i'm not even sure what day of the week it is what date it is things sort of blur together out here really you just have busy days and then sometimes less busy days the less busy days we call sundays <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
me and my cat has just made a remark about what happens to our landmarks that when they get knocked over by an elephant that's a good question there Mia then another tree the second one on the road becomes the 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 the, uh, the landmark quite often you are right there quite often things like that old lion kill or remember the leopard that was in this tree become irrelevant as time goes by and pans also dry up and get filled up and trees get knocked down you 100% right there but generally Generally, you know where you are, and if you don't really know where you are, you can always guess. But yeah, you are right. Sometimes the trees do go missing, and sometimes the pans get filled up, and sometimes people don't understand what you say when you say, they're at that place where the lion... Oh, well, Jamie's got a fishy go. Off you go. Guys, look at this. This is incredible. As we were driving away, and I don't want to get too close, so I'm just going to sit really still. The fish eagle came in and grabbed a catfish. And Jandre actually spotted it because it happened behind us. And because it's such an enormous catfish, it actually couldn't fly in towards the tree. So it stopped there. Ah, oh, this is awesome. I was very scared it was going to fly away, which is why we brought you across so quickly. But it seems for now it's settled. You can see it standing on the catfish itself. And it plucked it from that mud. I don't know if it was a live one. Ah, oh, look at that. That's incredible. You can even see the, the sort of the feelers on the end of the catfish's mouth. And now, what is this fish eagle going to do? Is it going to feed here on the ground where it feels, it feels a bit vulnerable? Or is it going to try and take its enormous meal up into the tree. It seems to be debating that question itself, actually. That's elegant. That's also incredible strength. Ah, oh, giving us a beautiful view of their tan leg, their tan feathers around their legs. It's actually quite a gruesome sight. I'm scared if I get any closer, and I know it is getting dark, so it starts to get a bit difficult, but if I get any closer, I think it's going to try and fly away, and I don't want to cause it to lose its meal. I was about to say hard one, but it's kind of fish in a barrel at the moment. No wonder this fish eagle's been spending so much time around Arethusa. Basically just goes to its built-in fridge, sort of, grabs the next meal whenever it feels hungry. What now, fish eagle? Now that you've sauntered right into the middle of the road. With great elegance. This is really interesting. Such fascinating behavioural insight into the way in which fish eagle will usually go about. Whenever I've seen a fish eagle catch a fish, they've taken it up into the tree. But I've never seen, because we, I've, I've actually never been around in a situation where the fish eagle has such easy access to a large, or a fish of this size. You often see them catching the tilapia and the, and the yellow fins that we get. Oh, wow. Try and watch where it goes. Oh. Well, that's tricky. Oh, there it goes. It's gone into that. It's gone over there. Let's go see if we can watch it eat. That's awesome. It's fascinating. Here comes another one. It looks like another juvenile. No, it's just a motley adult going in. That is a juvenile. It's definitely a juvenile. Okay, we're going to reposition, but while we do, I'm going to send you back across to Steph, who has got one of our all-time favorite elephant characters. Have a look at this little guy on top of quarantine. He's just made a hundred meter dash away from his mom. He's now with an auntie, not quite sure what to do, 
Mom needs to come and fetch him. He's a little bit uncertain. He goes, run, 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 run. Whoa, 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 wrong way. You're running away from mom. Where are you going? <laughs> That's very brave of a youngster. Very, very, very brave. He's going to be one to watch as he gets a bit older. He has the makings of a traveler. With his head up. Ellie's, this is his mom. Here he comes. Whoa, 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 whoa. Here we go. Faster, faster, faster. You got it. Come this way. <laughs> yes, they're cute. Ah, you already know this. Sorry, I don't get out on the cars as often as I need to. I hear that you call this little guy Benjamin Button because of his little wrinkly forehead. Oh, they're cute. What a character. Even at such a young age. Now well, they're all having a bit of a mouthful here. Destroying this variable bush willow. These bush willows do take a hammering, I must be honest with you. Most of them are coppiced around here, which proves that for generation upon generation, they've had these elephant chewing and gnawing at their branches. Beatrix in Bloemfontein, South Africa has asked me how many kilograms of food an elephant eats in a day. Beatrix, a, a female elephant like you're looking at right now will eat probably in the region of about 150 kilograms of food every day. They will eat in summertime, they will eat that 150 kilograms relatively quickly because of all the grass and vegetation around. But in winter time it sometimes takes them the whole day. They will eat by volume, they'll eat about 150 kilograms, but they'll stay hungry. And so they eat a little bit more in winter than they eat in summertime, just because the nutrition value isn't as high. But roughly about 150 kilograms for a female. A male will eat around about 250 kilograms. And a big male elephant is roughly double the size of these females. Can you believe it? Hello, little Benjamin. Yes, I'm speaking about you. Yes? Why don't you come and run over here so we can laugh at you a bit closer at us? The Hussein Bolt of the elephant world practicing for his sprinting. Yeah, he's wanting to come and have a. He's now wanting to come and give some nonsense to one of his cousins or aunties. I know a secret that Jamie doesn't know yet is the elephants are going to be keeping her awake the whole night. They're all around her house. <laughs> As you can see, elephants are incredibly social animals. And this little Ellie, even though his mom is in this bush, he is able to socialize with other elephants in the group. They, they're not horrible to him. They don't try and, they don't try and tease him. He will have this whole social group around him 24-7 for years and years and years to come. It builds an incredibly deep bond. And before it flies away, Jamie's still with that fish eagle. So go back there. Go and have a look at that. We'll stick with these ellies as long as we can. We are still with our fish eagle, and our fish eagle has still got its kill. Hidden behind the stump of this enormous leadwood that it has settled in, and I think that was actually its plan all along. I think it was going to try and settle in a tree that's slightly more resilient to its combined weight of the, the eagle and the fish. This beautiful, as John Doe described it, a stunning autumnal scene playing out in front of us.
absolutely gorgeous. Still hasn't fed yet. Only just checking out the surroundings. I'm surprised it hasn't gone about feeding straight away. The juvenile, by the way, that flew in has disappeared off completely. Come on, fish eagle. Are you going to feed? Perhaps not. Oh! It had it in its claws. It must have dropped it somewhere along the road. Wow! I did not realize that at all. I thought it had carried it all the way. When we last saw it fly, it had it in its claws, but apparently has dropped the catfish after all of that. Isn't it fascinating that it hasn't gone back and tried to search for it or grab it? They clearly don't feel comfortable feeding on the ground, which makes complete sense because then they run the risk. They're, they're heavy birds and they're not agile from sort of around takeoff. You know, they like to take the big, the high perches where they can soar down towards the river and catch the fish and rely upon the momentum. But they're not really agile takers off. I'm not quite sure that's a word, but you sort of know what I mean. They're not very agile at the point which they take off off the ground. Lots of flapping that has to happen. And I think that's why they don't feel comfortable at all feeding when they are down on the ground. And like anything from another bird to a hyena to possibly, well, it would be interesting to witness, something one of the smaller cat species might think of take, taking on a fish eagle. And this fish eagle clearly has decided that it's not worth the risk of plunging back down to the ground to gather up its kill. And hello to Johnny, who is our, one of our newest viewers. Johnny is eight years old from New Jersey. It's wonderful to have you on board with us on our safari. Now, Johnny wants to know a very good question, which is, is our fish eagle related to the bald eagle that he obviously has either seen or heard a lot about in America? Well, Johnny, yes, they are quite closely related. They're very, very similar in the way that they go about catching things. Of course, the fish eagle is more about the weight of the bird catching a fish, whereas your bald eagles are much, much bigger. A bald eagle is a lot bigger than a fish eagle. and But it, for us, a fish eagle is kind of equally important to South Africans as the bald, almost, not quite, but almost as important as the bald eagle is to Americans. We love fish eagles here in South Africa. It's great to have you, Johnny, and I hope that we get lots and lots more questions from you. Well, since our fish eagle hasn't managed to keep its kill, I think we're going to move on now. It's been a beautiful afternoon spent around Arethusa Dam. In the meantime, let's go back across to Steph and find out what is happening with Benji. There's a huge herd of buffalo. <laughs> We've just tried to position ourselves into a place where we think Benji's going to make his next mad dash across. I want to change, I want to suggest that we change Benji's name from Benjamin Button to Benjamin Bolt for the mad sprints that he's making. While, while you were with Jamie and that amazing African fish eagle sighting, Benji has made two or three mad dashes from one adult elephant to another. What we're waiting for is just another one for him to do it again. I think this is his mom. I'm not too sure. There was a little bit of a cluster around the one tree and I lost track of which elephant was actually Benji's mom. We might actually have the wrong elephant because I see this youngster that's coming up to us now is following this cow. Let's just see what happens here. Nevertheless, today has been such an amazing elephant day. It's crazy. I, this morning, I couldn't find an elephant for, for love or money. 
This afternoon, there isn't a bush we've been able to drive around that doesn't have an elephant coming out of it. And we actually haven't had that many elephant herds out here for a week or two. I know we went through a stage where there was just this place was just inundated with elephant. And it seems like whatever cycle those elephant have been on, they're back onto it again. What Ellie's all over the place. Couple now on all sides in front and behind us. I had a bit of a distance. I'm waiting to see what young Benji does next. Source of much laughter here on this car. I can see he's with his mom now. She's just moved off a little bit. Let's see if we can go around and have a look at him. <laughs> Definitely wouldn't have won that which, which cup is the pee under guessing at which one was Benji's mom out of this one. No, don't you push that tree down. Uh, Jammy, you all the way from New Jersey and you're a new viewer, welcome aboard. You've asked me a nice question, when do elephants first get their tusks? Now, elephants first get their little tusks coming out of their mouth at around about one year old. Those tusks then fall out, just like your teeth did when you were young. And then their adult tusks come in and take another couple of months to break free of their lips. And then they have tusks for the rest of their lives. Those tusks will stay theirs for the rest of their lives. So this young Benji, this little elephant that you're busy having a look at on the left-hand side of your screen right now, he doesn't have any tusks that come through his mouth just yet. And that and just his little size, the fact that he's swinging his trunk around, doesn't quite know what to do with it. Makes me believe he's a very young little elephant. He's probably no more than three months old. And that's his cousin in front of him. Ah. Jamie, in the sunset, has managed to bump into a massive breeding herd of buffalo. And before it gets too dark to view them, you are off to her. See you later. Well, I would actually say that the, the herd of buffalo bumped into me. And it is a, an absolutely massive herd of these animals. Dust flying everywhere. It's almost like a river flowing towards the Arethusa Dam incredible to witness. Look at them, they just keep rolling out of the dust. They must be... I don't know, I'm not even going to begin to guess at their numbers until I see the end of this herd. Let's go with lots for now. Lots and lots of buffalo. Probably about 500 or so, if I had to guess. Some of them looking relatively good. Others starting to show signs of the drought. Now a big bull walking right next to the car. And still they just keep appearing out of the dust. Absolutely stunning. It's just the sound of hundreds and hundreds of feet. The odd brush and cracking twig. As the herd moves as a unit. And is a limping buffalo, yes. There is one with a limp in the front. She's actually got a completely locked joint. There she is. She's at the back there. She's got a completely locked joint in her back left foot. She can't move it. Shame. Oh, there's a couple of them. Buffalo do often sustain leg injuries. And 
very often it's due to the fact that they've been racing away from something like a lion or just racing away in blind panic whether or not it is in fact necessary and what happens is they twist their ankles in holes in mud or holes in the art fark holes or anything like that you can imagine that running with 500 animals next to you it's a little bit difficult to look ahead at where you're running plodding irresistibly towards water. Wow. One massive bull moving along with the rest of the herd. I'm sorry, I'm transfixed. <laughs> this is such an incredible scene. And every time I think that the, the buffalo are thinning out, which they are doing a little bit, but every time I look, there's more of them stepping out from behind the trees. The rolling herds of buffalo of the greater Kruger National Park. Sometimes it's just nice to enjoy moments like this in peace. And while we watch our buffalo stream past, thank you to all of you for sending through your stunning screenshots. And well done to Jadre for capturing this incredible moment as it starts to get darker and darker. the odd moo from the stragglers at the back. Oh, how many buffalo do we guess? 600? 700? M maybe even more. Let's go with lots. <laughs> lots of buffalo. Obviously, it is starting to get incredibly dark and difficult for us to see these buffalo. We're going to start wending our merry way home, and while we do, let's go back to Steph. And speaking of merry things, back to Steph and Benji. That's exactly right. We're still with Benjamin Button Bolt here. He hasn't made any mad dashes. I think he exhausted himself on those first couple. But he's now interested in the base of this tree. Something there caught his interest. It's an ant nest or something. And he's now exploring it with the tip of his trunk. I don't quite know what it is. <laughs> Kicking around. He's a very inquisitive little elephant, this. I must be honest with you. He's going to get his trunk nipped by something living in a hole one day. Yeah, he's now tasting the sand. It's his cousin he's still busy hanging around with. And he's been with this little Ellie now for a good five or ten minutes. And that's how they're busy learning. Now they're busy playing with a stick. 
And that's really how they learn. Elephants are incredibly inquisitive, and it's because of this inquisitiveness that they learn how to do all the things that they do, how to feed in different manners, how to dig for water, how to dig open clay banks for kaolin and other mineral salts, how they learn how to feed with their tusks, overcome disabilities. They definitely have an imagination. Let's see what he's up to now. It's another base of a stick. I don't know what this little elephant is doing. <laughs> now he's coming back onto his racetrack. Let's see what he decides to do. Hello, boy. <laughs> Cute. I'm going behind his term of partner. He mustn't do that. Go forward a little bit and see if we can see him again. Sigrid, all the way from Switzerland, has remarked that an, the elephant that she saw has two holes at the end of the trunk. And is this two nasal openings? Absolutely, Sigrid. That's the two of the nostril openings in an elephant. How I always liken to what a trunk is, basically, if you put your thumb underneath your top lip and your other two forefingers, one in each nostril, and you pull out... And imagine extending it to past your arm length. That is a trunk. A trunk is an amalgamation of a top lip and a nose. And that is what a trunk is. And at the end of that, there's two holes. The vestigial remnants of their nose. Something nice on this tree. I don't know what it is. This little Ellie visits everybody in this herd. Everyone that's come close to him, he's going to go and say hello to. Hey, investigating another stick. We probably know more than 20 yards from this particular little elephant. He's paying us absolutely no mind whatsoever. Neither is his mom, which is a good thing. We don't want to make mom angry. Here comes another aunt. Auntie or a cousin. Now what are you going to do, little Benjamin Button Bolt? I don't quite know what he's going to, if he's going to burst into speed, jump up on his back legs, shake his head, dig in a hole. And just some tactile contact there, that's part of how they stay in touch with one another. It's amazing, it's starting to get almost dark enough that I can't distinguish these elephants from the bush with my naked eye. The lucky thing is, is that these cameras are allowing you to enjoy this particular sighting without much light going on. Let's see if I put on a little bit of light. It doesn't make too much of a difference. It does to his mom a bit. She's got a beautifully long tusk, and then the tusk closest to us is her slave tusk. The tusk that she uses more than the other one when she's feeding. She will be therefore left tusked. 
in her dimorphism. And you can see that she's made a fantastic chisel shape at the end of that tusk, prying open bark and wedging branches, and digging open things, breaking trees. That is the tusk that she will use above the other one, which you can see is hardly used at all. Using that very, very sensitive tip of the trunk to pick out morsels, stuffing it into their mouths. Almost a non-stop conveyor belt of food going through these elephants, <clears throat> especially at the moment. Every little last bit of new nourishment that they can find. Nice. I'm so happy that you got such beautiful screenshots of little Benji. Well done. Please carry on sharing all of those. We love seeing them. Right, and I think it's getting that time. It's a little bit too dark for us to keep with these elephants at the moment. I obviously don't want to scare any elephant, but I can't see where they all are at the moment, and I don't want to go blundering around where we are. Might give them a fright and tip the balance there and create a little bit of insecurity in this herd with people. So we're going to carry on going. Leave little Benji and his mom to their night's feeding. Good night. Thank you very much for letting us share your day with you. Go. I just had to greet them. I think elephant does deserve it of being greeted. Oh, look at that sky that's up there. Orange sky with this giant marilla tree that is silhouetted in there. Isn't that fantastic? James would be proud of you, Gert. He'd approve of the sunset shot of yours. <laughs> That is lovely. Old grandfather of a marilla tree. You can just see those branches in there just being broken off through wind and storm. Elephants and what not has this tree seen in its life on this planet? Good 200 years or so to get this size. Not the largest of trees out here, but definitely one of the most important because of the fruit that it produces. The marula fruit. That is a lovely shot there. Well done. Nice. Let's carry on to the next amazing thing. All right. Jamie's got that breeding herd of buffalo that have arrived at Arethusa Dam. Off you go for that exciting thing. They have not been difficult to keep up with our herd of buffalo, but we just thought we would show you this incredible scene that is unfolding in front of the Arethusa Lodge, with the floodlights illuminating them beautifully, highlighting all of the dust as probably 600 odd buffalo pile into the open area as a spot to spend the night. A nice safe spot, or at least a safer spot, for them to spend their evening. Nice and open, be able to see any threats that might try and sneak up upon them. And still more on their way, by the sounds of it. How absolutely amazing is this? Just buffalo and dust. And Andrine? Absolutely not. Um, 
I in no way think you should know this because it's actually quite complicated. So Andrine asked if there was a, a dominant female or a male in a buffalo herd of this size. And Andrine, no, there isn't. But it's a really good question that you've asked and it's something that we don't touch upon often enough. So I really thank you for raising this particular point. Buffalo don't have dominant members of their group. They will have the big bulls that just by size and by nature will always be more dominant than anything else. But there's some really interesting studies that show that the way that the buffalo decide to move is female-led. So the females decide where the buffalo are going to go. But it almost seems as though it's a democratic system. Now it's a bit, that's a bit of a stretch and a bit too anthropomorphic to describe it that way. But it seems as though groups of females, when they stand up and they move the herd, they kind of all stand facing a direction and they kind of reach a consensus and then move off. So that's what I've observed in buffalo behavior. It's also what I've read about in studies that have been done into the way that buffalo move. But otherwise, no, there's no particularly dominant male or female that leads the group in the same way they might be for elephants or anything like that. I think that actually pretty much spells the end of our sighting. Most of them have melted into the darkness off to the east of us. There's still some more on their way, judging by the moos in the distance. I can hear them roaring behind me. But I think it's time for us to leave our buffalo to spend their night out in the open clearing, hopefully safe and sound. But you never know, a herd of buffalo like this is a serious temptation for a pride of lions. Right, I think let's move on. Most of our buffalo have moved out of the light and it's now very dark. I'm facing out into the distance. I'm just going to turn around and then I'll turn my lights on. And a very interesting question coming through from Tasha as well. Hello Tasha, welcome as always to our sunset safari. Now Tasha's asked, is there a reason why they, live, they move about in such big groups like this other than searching for water? And it's, it raises an interesting point because that's what buffalo do. They're herd animals. They, you don't really find solitary females anywhere. They, they move together in a herd, and those herds are usually sort of minimum 50, right up to 500, 1,000. Some recorded cases of 4,000 buffalo, not necessarily in the Kruger National Park, but in other parts of Africa, 4,000 buffalo in one group. And it is a kind of safety in numbers, I guess, the reason that they have evolved to be that way. But it's interesting, because they've got two very distinct groupings. They've got the breeding herd and the breeding herd is females, males, young males, old males, big bulls, young bulls and calves all together as a group and then you get the Duggar boys. Those are the ones that we see more frequently because they're dotted all about either on their own or in small groups and it's interesting the way that in a almost buffalo have evolved to have two different social structures completely. It's fascinating. And it's something that I actually hadn't given much thought to before you asked that question, which is why our viewers' questions are so incredibly valuable to us. Well, on that note, unfortunately, we find ourselves at the end of the Sunset Safari, and it's time for us to say farewell to you all. So thank you, Jandre, for your fantastic camera work. We've got a long way to go to dinner, so I'm going to keep driving as we go along. And a thank you to the lovely entire crew of Final Control from Lou, Rebecca, Jerry and Chelsea. And most importantly, thank you to all of you watching us across the globe. I hope you've had a fantastic adventure with us and that you will join us in a couple of hours for the next adventure. Bye-bye, everybody. Welcome back for the last little bit of the Sunset Safari and how sad has it come? Today was it happened so quick. I mean, I must be honest with you. It felt like this morning safari for me lasted about six hours because we were looking for those lions non-stop. But so far, this morning, well, this afternoon has just been one elephant herd after another after another. It's just been fantastic. For those of you that tune into Brent on Facebook, I hope he gave you a good recitation of his gorilla story. We are all dying to hear what happened over there. Apparently it was pretty epic, so we can't wait to see 
we can't wait to see what's going on there. There's a big herd of impala that's just coming across the road in front of us. It's pretty weird that they're not on quarantine tonight. I wonder why they've decided to move all the way here. Nevertheless, I think this is going to be a good place for us to have our closing. Are they still eating? That's why. That's pretty weird that the fact that they're supposed to be on the open area now, but they feel the need that they still need to eat. So back to just today. Today's just been, this morning was quite, it, was, it felt like a transition. The lions left the property, leopard we couldn't find, no elephants. This afternoon elephants have moved back in. I'm told by the radio that the sighting that we had, uh, or that the sighting that they've had in Buffalo's Hook, the kill, is empty. And the lions all seem to have moved off, so who knows where they're going to be tomorrow. Let's see what tomorrow brings in terms of leopard as well. We haven't seen Karula or her cubs. We haven't seen Shadow or her cubs at all. We haven't seen Sindile in a couple of days. I'm itching to find out exactly where they are. But anyway, from myself and Khat, from the ladies in FC, from all of us here at Wild Earth, thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for your questions and your comments and for really just being with us during these days. I just have to say thank you on my part once again. Have a good night and see you tomorrow.